Startup Grind is active in over 600 cities around the world. I've been hosting Startup Grind here in Zurich for the last six years. Aliki, where's Aliki? Aliki is my co-director. And so if you have any questions about Startup Grind, about the community, uh, just talk to one of us. Um, we have a focus on making friends, not contacts, on helping others. And uh, tonight is about being educated, inspired, and connecting with other like-minded people. Uh, we host monthly events, and uh, tonight Google is our host. So thank you very much, Google, for hosting us tonight, for providing the Apero and the beautiful space. And thank you all for coming. Uh, the community is a big part of it as well. And of course, thank you, Max, for, for joining us tonight. And, Thanks, um, likewise. Yeah. So without uh, further ado, I guess we can uh, jump right in. So yes, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, for taking time for us and coming to share your story a bit. And we like to start a bit with going back and understanding a bit where you come from. Okay. Are, you, are you from Switzerland? Yeah, actually I'm from Switzerland. Okay. Uh, I was not born in Switzerland, I was born in Barcelona, but my father is Swiss, but my mom is South Korean. But I was mostly uh, raised in Switzerland, mm -hmm. on the eastern side of Switzerland. Yeah. Um, where, where did you grow up? Uh, in Diepolzell. It's actually one of the few islands in Switzerland, they say it, because the island gets cut through by the new Rhine and the old Rhine uh, flows around it, so it's more or less an island, they say. Okay, mm. that's quite different. <laughs> <laughs> um, when you were growing up, uh, did, you, did you think that, uh, or did you feel like you would one day have your own company? Uh, not at all. Not at all. I was um, definitely not thinking about that, but I was always quite invested in creating computer games, uh, creating art and software development and all this kind of stuff. As a kid, actually, I wanted to be artist or game developer. Mm. And so I'm nothing of both, but something in between. Um, and running, running your own company and having, having a startup you know, requires uh, a lot of thinking outside of the box. Did, did you have some influence from your relatives or your family uh, in, in, from an entrepreneurial perspective? Hmm. I rather say no. Uh, actually, my uh, family, um, no. I'm the first and the only at the moment, mm -hmm. which does this direction. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so, Birdly, do you have, do you have a, like a a tagline or what's the elevator pitch or the one-liner? Mm, yeah, that's what I always say, uh, beyond flying or uh, the ultimate goal to fly as a bird. Mm -hmm. It's a dream of everyone, so. Yeah, and how did, how did this idea come about? Actually, it started uh, at the university because I'm usually teaching at the Zurich University of the Arts and there um, I teach in the Department of Interaction Design. And so interaction design is not only UX or UI, uh, it's not always the interface. We are also interested in physical interaction and also um, in immersion and experiences. And so when I started the project Birdly, this was in 2013, I was interested how can you extend uh, virtual reality in the realm of your whole body, in a full body experience? Because at that time, most of the people didn't even talk about VR. And if they talked about VR, they talked about the, aud uh, the visual parts and the auditive parts. But I was interested actually in tactile feedback, in sense motorical feedback, and all this kind of stuff. And so I formulated a research project which brings my research topics together with my artistic interests, which were flying and the ultimate freedom. And so uh, with a collaboration partner, which was actually a, a wildlife organization for birds, uh, which they had an exhibition, 15 years uh, anniversary, and they made the show about the fascination of bird flight. I found a way to raise money <laughs> through them and start actually my research project. And the idea was really to build a machine which lets you fly as a bird. And the funny fact in that sense is uh, when we talk about uh, virtual reality or even simulators, the technology is pretty old and it started more or less with flight simulators. But the big difference is um, when you train on a simulator, then you train to control a machine. 
And my invention or my project was all about you're not having an interface which you recognize, you don't control a machine, you are flying like you're actually a bird or like you dream you are a bird or a flying object. What were some of the bigger challenges in the beginning? I guess, I guess because you, it's a combination of software and hardware. Exactly. So the thing was actually uh, all um, tasks by itself were not that much of a challenge actually if you have the knowledge. But I think the big, um, the big um, obstacle uh, was more or less to bring everything together and merge it into one project. For example, I always say uh, to my students as well, if you build uh, some immersion, as immersion means to dive into this kind of illusion in virtual reality, the weakest link is the link which breaks the reality or the illusion. And so if you build a project uh, with this complexity, you really have to uh, look for each aspect that it works out because the weakest one will give a tell, also will break it and then everything is uh, gone, more or less. Mm. And so for me, uh, it was definitely the area was big. As we started this at the art university, a lot of people ask me if we are from the ETH or something like this, but um, it, this project had to span a big area. It, has, it, it needed to have artistic direction, in creative direction, also a lot of uh, electronic skills and, and um, also um, these automatic skills like big motors and all that, but also quite um, developed software skills. And so to find everything under one head, that was uh, yeah, the challenge in the beginning. And when you started, uh, was it mainly yourself or you had some yeah. people working on it with you? Um, actually, I started with, uh, with myself as the lead programmer for the whole electronics part. But uh, the game development side, I started with one of my students. He's also one of my founders now and we still work together. And also another lecturer at the university, which is really good with uh, rapid prototyping in a mechanical sense. And he's also part of the funding team which funded the company. Company. And so we're still working together on that. Okay. How, long, how long ago was that? Uh, this was in 2013 and to realize the first prototype uh, we just had a half a year. It was really painstaking. We were working every day, Saturday, Sunday, till 11 o'clock. And in a half a year we had three simulators, so two simulators and one really early one. And with this simulator, we went to uh, the Seagraph, won a prize, we went to Sundance, we went to San Francisco to Swiss Next, and showed it all over. And from there, then it really started. Hmm. Um, you mentioned that you, uh, you got some funding for it. Um, was, it was this, uh, yeah, when, whenever you're doing, especially hardware uh, development, it requires a lot of uh, bigger investment than just software. Um, was that typical VC funding or angel funding or not? No, no, uh, this funding was more or less research funding. Okay. So it was really, usually when you do research at university, you have to go through maybe InnoSwiss when it's more commercial or maybe SNF and all that. But as my project was a little bit uh, out of the range of research in that area, it was quite difficult. And that's why I teamed up actually with this wildlife organization and they got the funds okay. through uh, other institutions. Yeah. And since then, have you raised uh, mm -hmm. venture capital? Or uh, not at all. We started the company self-funded. Yeah. And just recently, a, ho uh, a few months ago, we had a smaller investor. But uh, since the beginning, we started self-funded, had a prototype ready in a half a year. So no, uh, the serial version ready in a half a year. And from there, it was really um, stop and go. Also selling, build it, uh, developing, on and on and on. Would you recommend other founders to, to bootstrap and to self-fund as much as possible? Or would you, do you think it's better, would you have, do you think it would have been different had you had a VC? It, definitely, I think so. It would be totally different. But it's more or less a question uh, what the goal of your team is, in which direction do you want to go, and how do you like to work? And so very, in, the, in the very early stage, we've been approached by a huge company and they asked us actually to buy up 
but we didn't want to go that way because we didn't want to relocate. <laughs> and, uh, the, and mainly, they were just interested maybe in higher and acquire, if you know this term. And we really wanted to push and see how far this could bring us. And I totally agree. It's always the question, can you go through, do you have independence, or can you really execute quick and really penetrate the market with your product? And so these are questions which are still sometimes think back, you know, maybe this would be better if you had investments. But on the other side, the investors which approached me in the beginning had, um, had quite a different strategy, which I didn't agree at that time. And at the end, it was actually the right decision because in the beginning in VR, everyone thought it's the huge bus in home entertainment. They, for example, my machine is not at all a home entertainment machine, so it wouldn't make sense to put it at home. It's not a Peloton, even in that, not even in that price range. And they want to do a home version, which is stripped down with everything, then, then it doesn't make any sense. And now the big bus in virtual reality, or the big bus a, few, a half a year ago, was actually location-based entertainment. So really high-class venues where you have the sophisticated machines which gives, give you this virtual reality experience. Now they're all actually in that line because that's one of the markets which seems to be quite promising in this area nowadays. And why, why flying? <laughs> and that's a good, very good question, actually, because um, I started very early. When I was a kid, I was flying around pretty often. The flying experience was, at the baby was great. Nowadays, I think it's awful because I'm a little bit bigger. And uh, I was also paragliding and uh, I also was drone flying and all the stuff. So I was always quite connected with the term of flying. I was also very fascinated by the dream of flying. Um, for example, when I started the Project Birdly, uh, we explored how must it be to fly as a human uh, and you think you're a bird. That's impossible because nobody knows how a bird feels. And so at the end we studied dreams of people which are dreaming of flying and try to replicate that. And for me this was always a really intense feeling and also a very liberating experience because it, that's what I meant with the ancient dream of humankind because everyone, when I ask him, did you ever have a dream about flying? then normal logic is out of the play. People talk about emotions, about feelings, and that's where the very interesting discussion starts. And for me, that's something which is connected. Um, it's somehow out of this world, out of this plane where we're living, and so it has a very interesting notion for me, I think. So do you think that Birdly is more of a art piece or more of a um, gaming? Yeah. Actually, yeah, in the beginning, yeah, maybe, yes, everyone sees what they think, but in the beginning I definitely thought it was more like an experiment, maybe a little bit more art, more a little bit design research, but as a lot of people reacted to it very vividly, uh, I thought, yeah, it could be also gaming, but it, it, in the end it's just an experience platform where you can browse or yeah, uh, fly through cities, uh, through time, through space. And because nowadays, when you check out uh, documentary movies, uh, the, uh, now I have to start over. Uh, so when you're in virtual reality, one of the biggest problems is locomotion. Locomotion is the way how you uh, move from one space to another. And in virtual reality, as, uh, the more the illusion gets realistic, the more people get really sensitive how you move. For example, when you have computer games like Doom and you move around with a joystick uh, on the screen, it works. But if you do the same movement in VR, then you really get motion sick because you cannot move with VR left, right, up and down with a joystick. And so you have to give the body a clue how you move. And so for that, you need really full body engagement. In that sense, um, it was quite related to games, but for me, it's more or less yeah, the story is in the eye of the beholder. Some people see it a great tool for tourism, some people see a great tool for relaxation, some people see a shooting game in it, <laughs> and some people just see an exercise, a fitness exercise in it. So, 
You mentioned uh, flying through cities. Yeah. Um, we, I think it was two or three months ago, we yeah. had uh, Nielsen, Nielsen from, yeah. from Nomoko. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was interesting because uh, in, when you guys had the ex exhibit in Cramontana, I was able to, to experience Birdly. Yeah. And uh, do, do you have a lot of partners who are providing the virtual content for you? Yeah. Also, yeah. How's, um, how's, for example, the collaboration with uh, Nomoko? Yeah. So with Nomoko, it's a quite a interesting col uh, collaboration because they develop highly sophisticated photogrammetry uh, solutions, and they started with Zurich uh, as a use case. And we are actually always quite interested to get those kind of data because to fly through a city which you know gives you another kind of an experience because you can compare. You can fly through fantasy and then how can you compare to it? I always call it a frame of reference. Uh, in the beginning of Birdly, we had a scene where you were flying through nature and the people were flying 20, 30 meters over a forest and they said, oh, it's interesting. But then we put in New York and the people, the same people which were flying without any troubles had total fear of heights. Because now they see, oh, oh, now I'm 30 meters over the ground. When I crashed, then I'm really dying. Over the trees, they, they didn't know how the trees might look like. They didn't know how high they are. And so that's the difference. And I think the same thing counts even the more if you live in a city and you can explore it from total different angles because you have something to rely on. Or maybe you want to visit your office, you visit your home. It's just a playing ground um, of something which you know, which you can experience in a different light. Interesting, yeah. Um, if during the course of the conversation someone has a question, just raise your hand. Um, I think we have another mic so we can uh, take your questions as well. Uh, Aliki, can you, do you have the mic? Perfect. Um, I, th I think, uh, sure, I have two questions. First of all, um, you're successful because this was some sort of a passion rather than you probably intending to make money out of it, right? <laughs> Is that a true statement or a false statement? Or you always wanted to have a product that actually generates some sort of revenue? No, I have to confess, that's really not what I went for. So in the beginning, it was really more an experiment, which really went out of order. So when we first started to show it at conferences, people really started to call us, trying to book us, trying to sell it, trying to rent it, and we were not prepared for this. But then we yeah, fulfilled the customer needs. Uh, and then just a follow-up question in terms of how it's used today. Do you see a need for use in potential research then? Yeah, I think the EPFL bought one of the machines very early and they ran some experiments uh, with it. It's more in the field of neuropsychology because they have a setup, but it's more like a gaming setup. But the added value they had, it's a full, also they could move and activate the whole body and capture at the same time actually some brain waves. But this was maybe specific for that project, so it's a very specific case. I guess it's it's taking the the hardware the, the and and modifying the the outcome to to track what happens with the body when you put it in different situations. Yeah, they, I don't know how they called it, but the, there are some spe uh, specific neurons, mm -hmm. and when you have the feeling you can grab something, which is uh, something which is in the realm of uh, the ability that you can grab it, yeah. then they fire up, and they want to test how far can you scratch that, uh, as a stretch it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm interested because you have a product which yeah. is also not mainstream, yeah. right? And I think especially products which are non-stream, non they're not commercial, very often they have a deeper Because we are commercial. Sense. Sorry? We are commercial. Yeah, 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 sure. But you're not like in every house, you go, Ah, yeah, yeah, not any customer. You, yeah. Like in that sense. You said you're not in every household, you know, that's what I'm saying. And how do you go about if you have a product you know that is is fundamental, which has really a deeper sense, like maybe yours has as well, but it's not commercial. How do you go about communicating and um, commercializing? I mean, how do you go? How do you go about? Uh, we definitely go from the emotional side. 
And uh, the added value which we can generate is an empathic uh, revelation. And so our main customers at the moment are science museums, natural history museums, and zoos, aquariums, but also airports. And so a destination which look for an experience which people can enjoy, but also educate. So for example, we at the moment we have in the museum, Natural History Museum of Basel, two units with an experience which uh, gives them the view of a turtle which flies through the ocean, uh, which swims through the ocean, but also with the flaps. And the turtle has the, the chance to see actually how its home gets destroyed by the climate change and um, the coral bleaching and uh, yeah. Uh, the trash and all this kind of stuff which happens at the moment, yeah. May I ask, what yeah. are your hardware costs? Oh, the hardware costs? Per individual. Let's yeah. say if someone decides a museum yeah. or whatever, what are your hardware yeah. costs? Uh, I usually, in older days, I said it's in the magnitude of a nice sports car. And so it's under three figures uh, in, the, in the middle range there. Speaking of, of um, uh, the universities, and uh, so you're also a professor, and or you're currently a professor as well? No, no, uh, I was the head of the master's department of interaction design, but yeah, combining startup and having uh, administrative uh, meetings is quite difficult, mm -hmm. so at the moment I'm just teaching. Okay. Uh, well, I guess uh, with the, I was curious about um, how how do you combine the the university uh, interaction with your startup? And yeah. I guess it's basically it's two hats, or yeah, actually I do have two hats in that sense, but it's quite challenging, of course, because the schedule of a startup is really unpredictable and very hectic, and uh, university administration doesn't get smaller every year, so <laughs> it's a difficult setup. And what would you suggest to other founders who, uh, as, as you know, especially in the startup space, you often in the beginning have to wear multiple hats. You have to be a CEO, CFO, and marketing guy and all that. How do you manage the two different, uh, switching between the different uh, focus? I mean, switching between CFO, CEO, or CEO is maybe something else, but switching between uh, two jobs is something really difficult. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you really do a startup, then I, I would not wish someone to have that. <laughs> they should really focus on one thing. This makes it much more easy. And I think it's, yeah, because it's very unpredictable what startups are and because you travel a lot, you show a lot, and especially when you have hardware, you have uh, troubles all over the field which you really have to solve compared to software. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can give an update later, but with hardware, uh, it's something else, so I would really say, um, yeah, as a startup uh, founder, focus, focus in a very, um, very intense short time on to get it run. Yeah. Charles. Hi, um, thank you. So I, I'm going back to something you talked about um, in terms of the, like experience, I mean, in general, it's, it's about experience, but it, it also is about observation. And you mentioned, you made a reference to like the, um, the difference between people flying over the forest and over the city that they know and having like a different experience. Um, and I'm uh, like formally or informally in terms of on the company side or other people, you know, that, that are using this, um, in terms of the observations, um, is there any sort of um, gathering collection of this and, and what, are, what kind of patterns are, are happening there? Also we didn't have the chance to collect it very systematically because we have a lot of units out in the field and uh, but we've been at uh, quite a, at several venues which were very intense but the problem is sometimes those venues reflect a special time because when it's a festival when it's a show then there are certain kind of people and so this is a little bit uh, biased as when I would really scientifically try to check out how they use it. But it's very interesting. So one of the big findings are politicians and managers. They are very prone to not fly because they don't want to embarrass themselves in front of others. So we had uh, Macron, not Macron, um, the French president before, Hollande. 
So they didn't let him fly because nobody wanted to have a picture. Oh no, everyone wanted to have a picture where he was crashing and yeah. flying down. And so the security said, no, 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 nothing at all. And the CEOs or managers, higher managers, not the founders. And so they also had some reluctance to expose themselves in front of others. What is your business model like? Who buys it? So, okay, a politician doesn't want to crash, but would he be doing that at a museum? Would he be doing that at town hall? Would it, uh, so, so who do you sell to or rent to? So, um, as I mentioned before, uh, we really sell or focus this on in the area of edutainment. So, education and entertainment. So, our field are, um, is from tourism to education, like the science museums, like history museums, zoos, aquariums, but also entertainment centers. Might they be in shopping malls, might they be also at airports or at uh, some other entertainment venues. So those are target customers. And nowadays in the VR field, they always call this location-based entertainment. So those are our targets, but we are more specialized or focused on, um, on um, how shall I say it, on customers with, with high fluctuations. So because our ride is only three minutes. And so we are interested to have a high traffic uh, volume and places where a lot of people are. So for example, also at observation decks, uh, where people go there uh, for touristic purposes and so. A lot, of, a lot of startups have the challenge of product market fit. Yeah. Um, in your case, it sounds like, if, if I understand right from what you've explained so far, that sort of the, the, the market fit came to you. <laughs> Yeah, that's... Or are you still exploring yeah. that and, and you have a, a business development team that, yeah. or a unit that's trying yeah. to, to fine tune yeah. that? Uh, actually, that's a very good point because in the beginning, of course, with most of the startups, we just had the developers, more or less, the inventors, developers, no, sale pers no salesperson or business developers. And right now we are actually in the stage where we <laughs> increase it because before we were very opportunistic. We had also the luxury and the luck that we get asked the whole time by people and called up by people and interested customers. So we didn't have uh, to do active sales, which is maybe strategically not the right thing. But now, uh, as we grow up, we have also uh, started uh, to build up capacity in that area. Um, actually, I remember the first time I used Birdly was 2015 in uh, Genf, in uh, Geneva. and. Uh, on a lift, I think we met even personally, and I had a great, great, great experience. I crashed in a in a wall in San Francisco. <laughs> anyway, uh, I remember that San Francisco was very well designed. You were you were mentioning you have more cities. How many you are guys to design all this? Do you design by yourself, or there is other company designing this for you? Uh, the main development is here in Switzerland, uh, but we also uh, work together with companies abroad uh, or in other countries, such as Hungary or something. But just for the assets. Okay. So if we have the art and the, uh, the artwork together, then we let them build the assets, which we implement then in our scenes, and. We have some cities, yes, and we're trying to extend them because now photogrammetry is all over the place and it's finally also in a range where we can afford it, more or less. Um, but we also do um, uh, own content, which are 100% developed by us. And those are more in the field of imagination. So one of them is a dinosaur experience, uh, where we fly as a, as a pterosaurus 150 million years in the past and we shaped and modeled the whole scenery according to the paleontologists which we work together. And so this is nowadays exhibited in, uh, in natural hist history institutes. And how many that. you are in the team? Uh, actually, at the moment we have 12 people, but FTE we are a little bit under 10. Mm -hmm. On the topic, uh, on the t we'll continue just a second, on the topic of, of team, um, uh, many, many founders, you know, they start off you know, with the idea themselves, maybe they have a co-founder and then they invite a good friend to join and it's a small team and then, but then at some point you have to hire a total stranger. Yeah. Uh, what was that process like growing from two, to two or three people to, have to having to hire someone? Yeah. 
And what was the, what was like the biggest learning that you had in, in in starting to hire people? The thing is actually when you hire a total stranger, you have some uh, positive sides, but also you have the negative sides that you don't know them in detail. So in the beginning, I all hired students of mine, and I knew them since years. They worked under me or they studied under me. I knew really how they behaved. And if you hire a person just through the hiring process, then it can be sometimes quite, um, yeah, it can be different. Sometimes you think the person is great, but then really uh, the person doesn't perform. Sometimes you think, all right, this one is great, but you are super impressed and maybe if the person works. And so um, this was in the beginning uh, quite challenging for us. But I also have to say nowadays, you know, when you work, so long with colleagues and friends, the startup might change and the business model might change. That could be also a challenge. It's, and sometimes it's then easier to hire a person from outside again. Have you had to fire anyone? Uh, yeah. That's not very pleasant the first time, definitely. Maybe you uh, mingle around a week and think maybe I can solve it in a different way and then you come back in the second week, so it's very yeah, it's it's not a nice feeling, but yeah, that's how you have you have to do it. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. Experiences, your flying experiences, is mainly about like birds or dinosaurs. So I couldn't be Iron Man, for example. Or no, actually, you could be Iron Man, but we would have franchise problems nowadays. <laughs> but yes, it could be possible as well. But. Uh, Mainly why, because the reason why we incorporated a living being was more or less because we did it in the field of edutainment and not purely entertainment. Okay. And the second question would be, uh, before you said uh, a challenge had been to integrate full body, uh, body movements uh, to steer the thing, you know. Could you explain a little bit in detail uh, how you found the solution? Yeah. I mean, the solution nowadays, I always think it's very simple, but the problem is mostly um, um, motor coordination is for most people very challenging. So you can have, for example, um, the birdly by itself, I explain you first how it works. So you steer up and down only with your hand pedals. And we use the analogy if you drive in a convertible, you open up the window, you ha uh, keep your hands out. When you slightly tilt, then your hands get lifted. If you slightly tilt down, your hands get down. If you put it up like this, then it will be pushed back. And so that's the whole thing we did with the navigation. So you just have the pedals to navigate. It's also the same uh, way how a bird has the primary wing feathers. So like the fingers, how they use them. And then you can also flap. And with the flapping, you just accelerate. So you can combine those movements, and then you have a lot of variation because they're all analog, so it's not no digital. So you have this kind of variations. And in the beginning, of course, I thought, oh, it would be great to, to navigate with the tail of a bird, so with your legs. And you could also use movements of your weight and all this. But as soon as we started, we found out, oh, there are so many differences. There are so many people which are not able to coordinate that well under the, under the notion that the whole thing is moving. And one thing, we were at the GDC, the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco. The funny fact was there, you didn't have to explain anything. The people were flying like crazy, everything, everything worked. Then we've been at a festival like Sundance, where the actors and celebrities were, man, you had to explain them sometimes everything and they didn't get it. So you have a wide range of people, how they behave and how they coordinate with this kind of stuff. And so for me, it was important flying uh, the dream of flying, when you dream about flying, then you're just in the dream and spread your hands and you just fly. So you don't have to train. And so the goal was to make it as much intuitive as possible that everyone understands it maybe in a few seconds. And that's why we had to cut back on the complexity, but the accessibility mm, get higher. And where do you see, I mean, so you've been to a variety of different uh, um, exhibits, you know, from from film festivals to game developer festivals to also you know, virtual reality festivals. Where do you see the future of, of immersive entertainment going? Hmm. 
I think, you know, in the beginning of this kind of immer immer uh, immersive wave, everyone thought it's home entertainment. Of course, that's the biggest market, but it didn't work out at all. That's why everyone fled more or less to the high scale location based entertainment. I think uh, we are over the hype and it might come back like the internet came back because the technology is around. Uh, the experiences are unique. I mean, you can evoke feelings and tell stories and uh, experience stuff you cannot uh, experience otherwise in that framework. And I think it will come back. And so in that sense, uh, I still think we will experience this in location-based entertainment for the time being, but it will come back in another form as well uh, to the home. Yeah, I have a question regarding the uh, the content. I want to tie back to the uh, area where you explained that sometimes you have imaginary scenes and then you have realistic scenes. And uh, my question is uh, basically like, we're, for example, at Google right now, a lot of these large companies, they have maps and uh, they have a lot of uh, photorealistic content and 3D models of urban environments. Uh, and so maybe the question is warranted in this building that do you get easy access to these uh, assets through Google or Microsoft or these large companies or, or not that much? Yeah, I wish it would be like that. Um, actually, we had some experiences with bigger companies. Actually, we run the data, we could fly through all the data sets. But somehow these companies were not able to build then or to release the data or to find a license model for this. Because, yeah, there were some bigger companies which thought this is not affordable, this is too much work, or they were very protective about their data, how it's used. But now I think we saw the first uh, silver lining, or yeah, silver lining sounds a little bit too optimistic, but we saw uh, Microsoft with the Flight Simulator 2020, which comes up with this, and I think uh, from there everyone talks about digital reality, twin uh, reality, and the twin city stuff. It will be an element in our society that we will have maps and representation of our surrounding in a much higher level and will use it for several kinds of uh, yeah, entertainment or uses. And I think the technology is here, it's possible, and it's just a question of time. Speaking of, of content, um, how, how do you choose the next uh, world or the next uh, experience that you develop? Yeah. Um, I hope strategically. <laughs> we think about the markets nowadays. So if I would go for my gut feeling, maybe yeah, not many people would like that maybe or yeah, maybe not in a way that you make money. And so we think definitely for our markets, uh, like the museums, but also the entertainment and tourism industry. So we will have uh, several uh, products in that direction. As a products, I mean uh, software experiences, which you can try through Berlin. Hi, my name is Patrick. I'd like to connect on that, what you just said. I have some background in corporate and enterprise sales, so just uh, think of this. I had the chance to experience Birdly at the tech in San Jose and uh, at Fischershaus in Luzern, for example. And I saw there that uh, Birdly access is sold in, in so such one-time passes where you can fly once, mm -hmm. you pay some dollars, and um, that's how it's sold. Yeah. So um, in terms of how the museum sells the Birdly, mm -hmm. So in terms of that, or if you consider that, is there some return on investment calculation when you sell such a machine? Is this, is this the way how you sell it or is there some more idealistic uh, value in it? As you mentioned before that there's also costume development which seems to be quite expensive. In the beginning I was also a little bit illusionary about how much added value in education this could be into, but I think the institutes, they really calculate very hard. I mean, even harder in the, um, in the entertainment segment of uh, roller coasters and fairs, because they really calculate how much throughput you have, how much investment you have to put, when is the return of revenue and so on. In the museum you have a little bit less of these hard regulations because also the experience counts, how much education you bring in, what do the people which come in learn in that sense, but you definitely always have to challenge, you always are challenged by the return of investment, so it has to work out, otherwise, uh, yeah, it's too expensive. 
Going back a little bit to your your journey as a as an entrepreneur, as a as a founder, the, this whole concept. Um, what would you tell a younger you? Uh, what advice would you give to a young you? Uh, there are no shortcuts. <laughs> you have to go the whole way, uh, and. The biggest thing is actually really uh, not how much are you educated, how much um, you know from the business and how many business plans you made. Uh, it's more yeah, that you don't, uh, that you really go your way, that you keep, um, keep doing what you want to do. And the thing is actually in a startup company, you can be very quickly um, disillusionized or yeah, burned up by what you're doing the whole day and so you really need to have strong will or patience and to go through and uh, and believe in what you're doing. Was there a time when you uh, felt burnt out or felt like giving up? No, there was no time. It's always coming and going. <laughs> That's what I found out with the, uh, with the startup because at some day, you know, when you close the bigger business deal, then you think, oh, now I conquer the world. And a few days when you lose one and it doesn't work out or your machine breaks, breaks down, then you think you're in front of a cliff. And so it's coming and going. And from there, you yeah, really learn to cope. Was there any specific techniques that you've uh, um, found that work for you to... to so uh, nowadays it's getting more popular to meditate yeah. um, or to some people do sports. Yeah. Uh, there's a variety of things. Yeah. Spots, spots is always great. As I, mean, I love it. So I like it just because I always not see just it on in the my bird. class. Not just bird. No, not even there. No, no, no. I need the distance then. <laughs> no, spots is definitely good, uh, but meditation as well. But I think also just to be calm, don't take everything for granted. Also everything on the scale. Because some stuff can be really, you know, when you have to pay salaries and it gets a little bit tight, then you can be really worked out about that, but it's how it is. So you can make yourself crazy the whole night and don't sleep anymore, but you are not productive. And you have really to calculate how much, uh, how can you be productive with the time you have and when you need to sleep, then hey, you need sleep. You cannot work through for a week and then you're just uh, jam <laughs> at the end. Just gel. Sorry. <laughs> so, so you talked a little bit about the, uh, the software shift that you're doing and some of the other environments you're building. And you discussed the licensing model with the Iron Man idea. I think that was one thing. But uh, have you thought about different experiences besides flying as far as... Uh, Human machine interface, just like essentially what's next possibly for yeah. from a hardware perspective. Uh, from a hardware perspective. Yeah, I have there some ideas, but it's very difficult in that field to reveal it because uh, it's a very competitive field. And uh, flying is definitely something which I'm very interested, in, but I'm also I'm still very interested in a full body um, simulator. And there, of course. The Holy Grail would be a walking simulator, but in the way which we saw it now, it's super, super expensive and challenging. And so I, I would like to actually start something next year, but yeah, it's in other field. It's difficult to say at the moment. I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, I might be one of the rare politicians <laughs> who isn't afraid of crashing down. Okay. <laughs> because I was for 16 years in the Swiss parliament and I'm always trying to bring up some issues which are not in the mainstream yet. Now, when I was younger, I always dreamt my own dreams of flying mm -hmm. somewhere over. And this helped me a lot to bring up all the organization which I was able to found. And today I'm working for three years now as a hypnosis therapist. And we have a lot of very depressed people. They are not able anymore to have a positive adventure, to have an illusion, to have something like flying over, um, uh, over a forest or not even in a town. Would it be for you interesting to find something where we can push up yeah. 
depressive people and let them have an experience, an imagination, which they never had for years. And on this imagination, they could f see how it really is if they would be able to fly and they can incorporate it then into their dreams. Mm -hmm. It would be great for us. I totally agree with you and I see the same way. The only thing which uh, let me hesitate a little bit was uh, in the medtech industries, which in that sense I would be a little bit in medtech, you need the ethic commissions, you need this and that, and so I was a little bit reluctant in the beginning. And because I wanted to have a, um, a business running already, because if you have to um, to follow those kind of regulations, you need a little bit big, bigger pockets to survive that time. But what you say, I think it's very interesting and very motivating for me, because the funny fact is, and that's maybe a philosophical feedback to it, because, but when I uh, realized when people are flying on the simulator, they, when they come out of the flying experience, they are very exhilarated and they always have a smile on their face. This sounds like a cheap uh, selling slogan, but for me it was very interesting why this happens. And some people are really screaming, some people really feel joy. And for me it was quite interesting and I thought a little bit about it. There are several theories maybe, but one thing is definitely that the way how we move is usually on horizon and we are forced to use um, uh, our muscles to, fly, uh, to escape or so and when you're flying then you're free in all directions and this is very freeing and you can maybe escape every predator more or less and I don't know maybe that's the connection how it is but I also had once a friend he's paraplegic so he's in a wheelchair he's always on the same plane and when I brought him on the machine, I had to lift him with some other friends up there. And so for him, it was super interesting because he could slightly go up, down, left and right and have the freedom which he usually doesn't have. And so he said actually at the end, this relaxed him in the parts which uh, is very tense usually. And so I definitely think this direction could be very interesting. We also had a potential customer in the field of, um, in the health industry from other, other country, and they wanted to conduct maybe such kind of tests. And so we are looking in the field because, yeah, I think it's very interesting, but you need a longer breath for a startup company that's a little bit tough. So we thought first this, but I would like to come back to that definitely. Uh, thank you very much first. It's uh, it's very impressive uh, for me to, to hear this. I came a little bit late, so I don't know if you um, if you mentioned this already, but my question is more, uh, I myself and a lot of people I know and I work for and with, they are more an auditive person, not so much visual person. So the access to the subconscious mind and, and to the world is through uh, through listening, more than through visual things. So my question is, are you doing these things also combined with some audio pieces or some sound things? Or in, does this relate to if you fly more up as a bird, you're getting a little more quiet, and you come down, then you, is this also part yeah, of it? Yeah, definitely. Uh, we, uh, we also, uh, I mentioned in the beginning, um, the field of immersion uh, consists of several aspects and factors. And so when the visuals are great and the auditive part is bad, then it doesn't work out. The same for the tactile part and all that. And so for the auditive elements, of course, we're working with spatial sound and we also work with a tactile feedback with real wind with a fan which blows in but also the sound changes then so when you fly faster then you have more noise if you fly down you have this and the funny fact i don't know if you ever realized that if you drive a bike you hear the sound which is uh, is noisy but if you turn your head in the direction which you drive you don't hear the noise anymore uh, usually people don't do it because they would maybe crash but that's a weird thing and when we started to simulate this I thought ah, this feels unreal but it's real and the funny fact is in the simulator I call it actually the fantasy physics so we build in the physics in a way which people think that's real not how it's real and the funny fact is people go down and say wow that's really realistic how did you calculate that and I said yeah by feeling it <laughs> Because when you can fulfill people's expectation of reality, then they gratify it with this. And 
uh, that sounds maybe a little bit cheap, but the problem is people are not flying. So the only thing they know about flying is their fantasy. And if you simulate reality, then they have, they have to train. It's like in helicopter, you know. I had once a student, he wrote a piece about um, uh, the dream of flying and how the life changes when you are a helicopter pilot. And he thought this would be ultimate freedom. He could go from one place, land at that spot, be there, totally freedom. And so he went for three months to learn helicopter flying to California. And when he came back, my first question was, hey, how is your dream of flying? And he said, Ugh, there is no dream of flying, it's the nightmare of dying. <laughs> and so <laughs> he was constantly reminded, hey, don't fly with your guts. Look on the instruments, otherwise you're dead. That much about reality. <laughs> Sorry. So I wanted to go back a little bit to um, no, let's say, to you. You said uh, before about having deep pockets in order to uh, to focus on some of these other areas, um, and, and then also you you mentioned. So are you are you looking into investment opportunities? If they share the vision, then. Um, I don't have anything against it, but it has to follow our line, yeah. Right now. And um, you mentioned also earlier that someone offered to, to acquire you guys, but, but that was not an option at the time. So do you think that in the future that would be an option? Because, I mean, usually it's, it, has, it, goes, it ties in whenever you take investments, yeah. you know, then, then you, you need to start exit. thinking about <laughs> a, an exit strategy. Yeah. Uh, you know, the thing is actually our product is very weird. As a strange, it's not a, a, a market which is known by a lot of people, especially in Switzerland, when you're not in fintech, medtech, or other kind of thing. Entertainment is a little bit awkward for, in Switzerland, even if it's a big market, or even tourism. But uh, in that sense, um, I rather think, um, yeah, if we find investors which are really interested in what we are doing, then mm. it's okay, otherwise. Uh, yeah, we work how we work. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I guess it's it's sometimes a little bit slower, but you, then you get to actually do what you want to do. Uh, you know, eventually you reach your goal. Might take a little bit longer, but it's more true to your own personal vision. Yeah. That's definitely true, but you can also miss the boat. Yeah. Sometimes that's yeah, it's a challenging area. Even sometimes you're too slow if you don't have additional investors. But yeah. That's the up and down sides. Mm -hmm. mm. What's what's a, a mistake that you would that you would want other entrepreneurs to avoid that you've made, or that you've seen happen? Hmm. Yeah. Don't try back. I'm not. Uh, now I say this, but I don't know if I challenge this at all, but what I think is don't shy back from hard decisions if you know they are true. Because sometimes you think, okay, this is really harsh, but you cannot execute it because it's a little bit too sudden, but if you know it, then yeah, you have to do it. And in, in building your team, what's, um, how have you gone about creating the, the culture that you want to have you know, with new people joining and having um, the culture that you uh, envision for, for your team? Well, that's a very difficult question as well because um, as the team grows, it changes. You cannot have a team where you every night go out for beers and everyone talks about the whole thing till the morning, till they cannot drink or something like this. Not that, that we did it, but I mean, it can happen sometime. And, but now when you have a uh, company which is growing, you have different fields of um, needs in the company and you have also then different kind of people, which are the right people for that place, but not the right people maybe, which are feeling this kind of uh, a need or company culture. I'm not such a big fan of a company culture which is um, cultivated. I think that's a little bit, yeah, how shall I say? For me, it's, sometimes it's quite awkward, awkward when I meet companies which have a huge culture and everyone behaves like this. I'm a very skeptic in that sense. <laughs> I think it has diversity is the most interesting thing if you have people and not if everyone is the same or everyone believes the same. And I think like you have to cope with this and tolerate that and that makes it at the end also interesting. And 
of course, you'd probably say that uh, you know, Birdly is, is, is the, your main focus and your main interest, but uh, besides that style of, of uh, VR, yep. um, has there been any other exciting technologies that you've seen recently, or what, what stands out to you when it comes to, to uh, new technologies in the space of XR, VR? Mm -hmm. There's, there's also been a lot sort of uh, yeah, the hype of augmented reality that kind of yeah. came and went. And yeah. I, th I think uh, I was always fascinated by augmented reality, but it's always a, a question of timing. And I think uh, augmented reality is much further away as most people would hope for. Sorry, Jakob. <laughs> and uh, it's like with VR, there are hypes and hoops and loops. And there are also other technologies which maybe everyone is excited about this, like the, um, the possibilities of AR, uh, not a AI, I mean. But for me, uh, yeah, I'm definitely also interested in, in technologies. It's a little bit difficult to say because I would reveal my next research project. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know yeah. where I should stop. Sorry for that. Yeah, that's fine. It's okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. We like to to wrap up. I think you know, it's it's a very interesting topic. Um, I think there's there's a lot to explore. There's so many different applications for it. It's still even though it's been around for a year, it's been a couple of years you've been working on it. It's, it still it feels in its infancy. So I think there's a lot to explore and a lot of applications. So, but you're still around a little bit afterwards if people want to talk to you. Oh, yeah. I didn't okay. have a beer yet. Okay. <laughs> um, so we'd like to wrap up with a, a, another short series of questions and uh, we call them rapid fire questions. And there's no right or wrong answer. It's just the first thing that comes to mind. Okay. Uh, so, so what's, what's one, one item you own that you would never sell? Oh, now I thought already too long. Mm, not much. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> what's, you, what's your most unusual skill? Hmm. My doubt. What's more important, strength, speed or stamina? Yeah, the boring one, the stamina. <laughs> <laughs> and which historical figure do you admire? Hmm. There are so many of them, actually. Hmm. Hmm. The first one that comes to mind. Uh, I'm not good at that. I think. <laughs> 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 hmm. We can also skip that one. Yeah. What's 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 your favorite season of the year? The season of the year, uh, autumn. When was the last time that you tried something new? I think at last holidays. Team or single founder? Team. Cats or dogs? Cats. Beer or wine? Both. <laughs> <laughs> What's the favorite app on your phone? Oh. Hmm. It's not an app, but it's called Mute. <laughs> it's, a it's a function. Yeah, a you're feature. right. <laughs> but you should you just sell it as an app, as an add-on. <laughs> Paid <laughs> by use. <laughs> what's, what's something on your bucket list? Oh, um, trail running. And if you could have the attribute of any animal, what would you choose? Besides the obvious. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sleeping as a cat. Not flying. No. <laughs> you do that again. <laughs> yeah. The whole work. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for your time with us this evening and for all that you shared with us. <laughs>